Good evening. Good evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to welcome to the program, on this segment of the program, Mr. Jock Sartinsky. And Mr. Sartinsky is the chairman of an extremely interesting organization called Professional Disarmament Network, That's Professionals right. Disarmament Professionals. Network in New York. And uh, Jock Sartinsky, welcome very, very much to Conversations. The organization, maybe you could share with us, uh, that you're the chairman of and helped get started a few years back, is an umbrella organization of a number of professional groups concerned with the questions of uh, disarmament, uh, the threat of nuclear weapons, and so forth. Maybe you could share a little bit who some of the groups are and when you came together in this umbrella organization that you have, if you would. Surely. There are many different types of organizations who are interested in opposing nuclear weaponry and war. The Professionals Disarmament Network is really the, as you describe it, the umbrella organization or the network of the various social responsibility organizations, the professional social responsibility organizations in the New York metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of our organization, we have the physicians for social responsibility, the lawyers for nuclear arms control, the educators for social responsibility, uh -huh. uh, the architects, the uh, social workers, the life insurance committee for nuclear disarmament, and this group came together around certain consensus issues, each group doing its own thing in its own way on many other issues. Yeah, the physicians have been together for a long time, haven't they? That's right. Very they well they have been term. together for a long time, and they have dealt with many other social issues other than nuclear weaponry and matters related to nuclear weaponry. Uh -huh. But in our network, we restrict ourselves in order to maintain an absolute consensus and agreement and to mobilize the greatest strength to oppose nuclear weaponry, the environmental consequences of nuclear weaponry, and to come up with plans which can allow from, for an economic conversion by the United States from productions of nuclear weaponry and testing of nuclear weaponry into a logical transition to the production of consumer goods. Marvelous, yeah. yeah. And so that, that's part of the equation that's very important yeah. because unfortunately the war machine or the economics of war making has been built into the economy. There are many economic interests that are involved in that. That's an issue that really has to be responsibly dealt with in order to be able to pragmatically move ahead, I'm afraid, given some of the political uh, opposition to people who have an interest in the status quo. Yeah. Well, certainly over these past years, the only opposition uh, to end the nuclear race was not just of a political nature, was not just of a matter of this is what the United States needs for its national security, but has been for the major corporations on one hand to earn large profits on a uh, cost plus basis, and on the other hand for the working people and the uh, white collar workers who are employed by those corporations uh -huh. to maintain their jobs, yeah. uh, which gave them a very distorted kind of position. Mm -hmm. uh, many of those people would not be in favor of going to war, or be in favor of nuclear weaponry, but what do they do about their jobs? Yeah, that's right. So right. the matter of ending nuclear weaponry because it's unassess unness be not being necessary, uh, it, it's drain on our economy, uh, it's danger to the environment, uh, really has to, the solution for it has to also be seen in terms of how do you maintain a stable economy while you're creating the process to end this great danger to our yeah. Earth. Yeah, we all have recognized the danger to the Earth. Uh, unfortunately, even as you and I sit and talk, I don't have the exact figures, the atomic arsenals are building a pace. They continue to create these weapons which have no earthly use whatsoever. They cannot be in any rational sense ever used, but the arms race, particularly here in the United States, they continue to produce these weapons, even though perhaps hopefully, as you and I were talking before the camera, the geopolitical realities that maybe we're coming to the end of the Cold War. New York Times now runs an article to that effect, that there are changes in terms of the relationship between the superpowers that might signal a new relationship that would make even the rationale under which they have been built up increasingly obsolete. Yeah. That's absolutely true. We presently have in our possession, and the Soviet Union has in its possession, enough nuclear weaponry to destroy us 40, 50, 60 times over, Incredible. and for us to destroy them. Uh, certainly, there is some hope, uh, as you indicated, the New York Times editorial and George Kennan's article recently, and the whole matter of 
Gorbachev's position being put before the Very world. Hopeful, yeah. That there's a, the likelihood is, is that there is no longer any need to maintain the Cold War in any sense, but go back to what John Kennedy was striving for 30 years ago, and that is to have a world of coexistence where we can work together uh, to serve the purposes of all people in both nations and in all nations in the world. Yeah. So, and you're 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 interested in the question, particularly and primarily of the of the nuclear uh, absurdities of nuclear weapons and so forth, and professional organizations that are concerned with that. But your charge does, in a certain sense, go beyond and consider some of the implications of uh, weaponry, other than nuclear weaponry, and also to the conditions for a just and durable, perhaps long-term peaceful, more peaceful situation that we can see. So it's a, it's a great deal to be concerned with, but it begins with the absurdities, as it were, of the atomic, uh, of the atomic question. That's true. There are many organizations now and with whom we cooperate and participate with who are having great debates as to what the long-range approach to create a form of permanent peace in this world. Uh, sitting here today, we would have to say that's somewhat utopian. At the same time, we must make that effort. Uh, but this can only evolve if we deal with the immediate problem. The immediate problem is today, by design, by military policy, by accident, by terrorism, our Earth can be destroyed. Hundreds of millions of people can die. We had this little incident yesterday where the gun turret in the battleship Iowa uh, explodes. Forty-seven sailors are killed. Well, it's that very same battleship Iowa where the Mayor Koch and the Navy are attempting to berth in Staten Island carrying Tomahawk cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. Each one of those missiles with 15 times the strength of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. With all the assurances that nothing could yeah, ever and happen. nothing can ever happen. Accidents cannot happen yeah, in the Navy. Apparently, yeah. There is no evacuation plan of, it, of any substance if it does occur. There's no accident crisis plan. And as of this moment, unless Congress changes its mind or the New York City Board of Estimate changes its mind, a nuclear-laden ship will be berthed at Staten Island in the next two years. Yeah, and if it isn't birthed there, it'll be birthed somewhere else in these United States or, and the question is a larger one in a certain sense. Obviously, New York would be a targeted city. I mean, uh, zero one in a certain sense in, a, in, in, in any kind of an exchange, but there could be, as you say, an accidental develop, uh, release of that. Uh, do the members, how, how many organizations do you have in the uh, organization? I mean, there are 12 organizations at the present. Professionals, all professionals, professionals people, organization. Right? Yeah. We have one oddball organization of which I'm chairman of the Life Insurance Committee for Nuclear Disarmament. I'm a businessman fundamentally. And, you have a uh, real interest in that. Well, yeah. Yeah, right. We think, uh, <laughs> we believe in life. Yes. Life indeed, insurance right. companies cannot make a profit when people die. That's right. That's know? right. Yeah, so right. we want to be as crass as that. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we believe in life philosophically, and we find that we have many, we have a number of life insurance company offices and the heads of the professional organizations. Uh, in our organization, yeah. and we have aligned ourselves with the other professional organizations. Have the people in the organization, you've been founded now about how long has this been going? Just a couple of years. The years network ago. has been about two and a half years. Yeah, all right. Now, there have been policy questions that have arisen uh, over the years. There was a large freeze movement that happened in this country. Uh, there was the resumption of nuclear testing that many people, Carl Sagan and others, took exception to. Uh, there was a strong element in Mr. Reagan's foreign policy of placing nuclear weapon. Uh, cruise missiles in, in Europe uh, to uh, take a peace through strength attitude that many people took exception to. There are many people in Mr. Reagan's administration who feel that if there is peace now breaking out, it's only been because of the strong military peace through strength philosophy that he had built up over the years. Things have changed in order to make those presumptions that they had, or the, uh, that they had uh, no longer valid. Or were there exceptions taken to that peace through strength attitude that Mr. Reagan had uh, enunciated almost philosophically among all your members all along? Right. Well, we always felt that this peace through strength argument was a rationalization in order to maintain a large military presence and in order to create America's influence 
throughout the world in various nations by the very strength of our military. But it was an argument obviously advanced by President Reagan and others in his administration. Uh, I think that while I personally will feel very strongly against that argument, I think the matter now is moot. And that argument no longer can be properly raised in view of the present political context. If we don't have an enemy trying to destroy us, why do we need peace through strength? Mm -hmm. When I say destroy us, I mean militarily. Mm -hmm. They may want to outstrip us from an economic point of view, as Japan has already done, mm -hmm. and we may take umbrage with that and decide we're going to fight them on an economic level. That's great. Mm -hmm. But if we no longer have a, uh, a military threats against us in any real sense, then the, the whole peace through strength argument is now a moot question, and we can, in retrospect, argue the past as to whether it was right or wrong. Uh, Spiggy of Brzezinski has a book out recently, in a certain sense, saying that the peace through strength has worked, capitalism as a philosophy has worked, socialism is in retreat. We have essentially won. The capitalist or Western forces or American forces have essentially won, and capitalism as an economic standard and way of organization individually oriented uh, production and that uh, private property has won and has taken that position that we've essentially won, as it were, uh, the war. Is there any point in our thinking about the relationship of the Western or the American experience in terms of our relationship to the rest of the world at a politically ideological level apart from the weaponry? The interesting thing is when Mr. Brzezinski says we have won, the question is, who has won? Mm -hmm. What have we won? How long will we have it if we've won it? Mm -hmm. So he could say, yes, the Soviet Union has retreated. He argues because of the American military presence rather than, in my opinion, their own internal needs and economic needs and political needs. He argues that capitalism has flourished. Well, most people are not capitalists. Mm -hmm. I'm a businessman, mm -hmm. and I deal with people who earn a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that the individuals in our society have basically benefited by this war program. Mm, much less the underclasses of this country. And without, the right, yeah. without the homeless and without the deterioration of our education, without our drugs, our monies have been used to build military, we have undermined our basic political structure. We have undermined our social structure. We have undermined literacy. We have undermined hospitalization. Who has won? Uh -huh. Brzezinski may have won in his mind. Uh -huh. I don't think the American people have won. Not only that, but I think we're in a new crisis as a result of it, which has not unfolded. Our 42, I'm sorry, a $24 trillion <laughs> deficit. A, yeah. a trillion dollar deficit. Yes, right. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. Is an overhang of such magnitude that we are in economic crisis and we cannot be certain what the future will bring for us in terms of an economic stability. We see we have no monies to remedy our crumbling infrastructure. Uh -huh. No monies are available for any of the social matters like we talked about a moment ago. So I don't quite understand that we have won. Yeah, right. Mr. Brzezinski may have won. I don't think the American people have won. Yeah, so it might be that this, uh, this philosophy that he would think is going to instill itself all around the world, that, so that the questions that are going to be in debate among the peoples of the world are still there, but some of this debate might well take place within the realm of economic policy and within the realm of uh, social, economic, or even moral thinking and so forth. And the need to have this overarching uh, uh, atomic weaponry and so forth is not only a detriment to our own interests, but it is a major threat, perhaps, that's confronting not only our economy, but the world, in a very real sense. To that we do not find a response to Mr. Gorbachev's initiatives and so forth makes us, in a very real sense, the United States of America, the major problem area as far as the continuation of our species is concerned? Well, in, in general, yes, in mm -hmm. terms of the continuation of our species, but even in a much more expedient fashion. It is, we are now on the outside in mm -hmm. the world's view of mm -hmm. what's happening in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. While we are restricting ourselves from trade, while we are restricting ourselves from various treaties that should be considered in order to end nuclear weaponry and perhaps conventional weaponry to a certain extent as well, the Japans and the Germanys and the French and all legitimately are creating their reconciliation with the Soviet Union, establishing a new context of relationship 
and it will be the American people who will be frozen out of this and who will not be able to share from an economic point of view, let alone a social and moral point of view, out of what is hopefully going to be a growing and extending and a deepening of coexistence in this world. Yeah, yeah, and that we don't have a way of relating to that way of finding our interest in that new context makes it a threat. If we hold to old patterns of thinking and not be able to move with the times, as it were, would make us the major threat in a very real sense of a, a reactionary uh, attitude toward what the world and the possibilities of a, of a new peacefully oriented world offers. If we don't have a way of relating to that, we become the major threat. And we it's important that as citizens we try and find alternatives that can allow us to move with the, uh, the positive possibilities that the time presents. Right. Absolutely. Uh, a little example is demonstrated in today's paper where uh, uh, Dick Cheney, uh, is, as the New York Times reports, uh, has reassured uh, uh, Mr. Kohl, Chancellor of West Germany, that he will not be putting any pressure on West Germany to extend the nuclear weaponry and agree with the American position as to nuclear weaponry in West Germany until after the 1990 West German elections. Uh -huh. He obviously recognizes that the German people are not interested in this. We in the Professional Disarmament Network feel that what has been missing in our country is a true participatory democracy, mm -hmm. that people have not been participating. They have been leaving it to the President or to the Congress or the Senate. One of our big thrusts in our efforts is to meet with various elected officials, to express our point of view, to get our membership to write and meet with their own elected officials, to constantly talk to those who we have elected in the past to get them to reconsider the past and to develop a position which is appropriate for this day and time. Yeah, all right. No, no larger task can there be in a certain sense of citizenship but trying to find that right. and to, to call up the uh, absurdities of the, uh, of the atomic weaponry and so forth is one thing and also to do it within a context that we, you know, you were talking before of trying to find an alternative way so that the war making capability of the economy could be effectively, efficiently, and pragmatically converted to peaceful use is a major question that is of concern to you at, in, the, in the network. As well. It's of absolute concern, and it has its side values. Mm -hmm. We feel this also helps strengthen a democratic process by bringing people into the process, by getting them to vote, to run for office, to express themselves. We feel, incidentally, that the greatest beneficiary to people who participate is the individual itself. I feel I'm the greatest beneficiary of my efforts. I have a social responsibility to my community, to my nation, to my society. They've given me a great deal. Yeah, I think I should give something in return. Yeah. And I'm really expressing the view of the professional disarmament network people, not just my own. It sounds idealistic in a sense, but at the same time it has pragmatic it, roots or not, pragmatic uh, it is, outcomes. It is practical. Uh -huh. It is practical if it makes my day better and if it makes our day better by participating in a democratic process. If we feel that we are making a contribution to our society, then we are benefiting immediately. How significantly we will benefit will depend upon how successful we are in presenting our point of view. What we're really talking about in the words of Isaiah, Isaiah in this Passover season is how we might be able to really and truly see the means by which we could begin the process of beating the spears into plowshares and that such is something the promise of the time in which we live is that we might be able to pragmatically and rationally begin to move beyond the studying of war such as we have throughout the period. It is a very optimistic perce perception you have of the potential for the human condition. We think it's realistic. We uh, think it's necessary. It's realistic, but it is it's, optimistic. It's optimistic, right. true. Very often they take optimism uh, as being it's against realism. It's optimistic, but it's realism. Uh -huh. We feel there is no other appropriate course mm -hmm. that what are our alternatives? Do we live under the threat of war all the time? Do we look, live under the threat of a nuclear weapon? Do we live under the threat of nuclear uh, weapon wastes affecting our environment? Do we want to live in a society where people are unemployed because there are no jobs? Uh, if, if you end the military uh, uh, production and don't have a, a substitute for it, we have no alternative but to make the effort. We have a status quo that many people have power in terms of and relationships of, uh, of uh, concern in terms of uh, 
that they will not, in a certain sense, or from the perceptions of many, those who benefit from a sense of uh, maintaining a sense of, uh, among the people of, uh, I don't want to use the word loosely, paranoia, or the need to have defense, the need to take the traditional pattern, they benefit from that, and there would be many people who would be perhaps take umbrage at the idea that this is only this kind of thinking that we're advancing and thinking here is just um, idealistic and not really practical, and they take that traditional realpolitik view and maintain prerogatives and positions of power that they have by keeping the situation as it is, if you understand what I'm saying. These people have become the target then in a certain sense of uh, a broad-based perhaps coalition of it's not a question. It's not a question of ha it's not a question of having a target. Yeah. It's not a question that we have to p oppose philosophy. We have to construct our own philosophy. Mm -hmm. We have to construct our own attitudes. We have to construct our own constructive positions. Mm -hmm. There are those who will disagree with us. What we're seeking is that the majority of the American people agree with us. Mm -hmm. uh, that will decide. The future. The majority of the American people and also perhaps a, uh, an increasing majority or influential minority of the professional people who have an important role to play in terms of public opinion and thinking and increasingly roles of uh, responsibility for the operation of our economy. It comes back again to the importance of the United States finding a new direction for itself that we're all groping toward and such is the task that we as American citizens have before us and it perhaps is incumbent upon the United States more than any other power in the world to attempt to find that liaison with this new positive possibility of the of the future. Well, if we because had a, we are the major threat. Right. right. If we had to draft a resolution uh, describing that uh, question, I would think we can incorporate much of what you said into it's that <laughs> resolution. Well, well, I can't think of any work. I really do congratulate you on bringing together a number of people, professional concern, citizens of concern, and they also have the pragmatic uh, aspect of that. And I want to thank you very much for coming in and introducing it to. Could we let the people know where they could communicate with you at the uh, professional network? We have an address where mail could be sent. And yes, the professional system network at 70 West 40th Street, 10018-869-2400. The administrator is Babette Linfield. Babette Linfield they could okay. be in contact with. with and Okay, well, then people can be in touch with that. And we want to talk more with some particularly uh, trying to get around to some of these questions of how we're going to be able to convert toward an increasingly peaceful economy out of the beat the plowshares into, or beat the spears into plowshares and so forth. And we want to do some more talk about that on this program, but we run out of time for this segment. I do want to really thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for coming into the program. And I remind you and the television audience, cable audience, it's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of Jacques Sartinsky, who is the pre chairman of this incredibly interesting organization, Professional Disarmament Network. And Jack, once again, thank you very much for coming in and for all of your work. Thank you. Uh, please do stay tuned. We'll be coming back momentarily. That's it for this particular segment. Coming right back. Thank you. Welcome, welcome very, very much to this segment of Conversations where I'm very pleased to welcome to the program Dr. Seymour Melman. And Dr. Melman is a uh, long-term uh, professor of uh, in industrial engineering with the Columbia University, just recently emeritus, and has written more prolifically than perhaps anyone else in our society in the implications of our mil military-industrial complex and the possibility of conversion from a military-based economy to one that perhaps is more appropriate, and Dr. Melman, welcome very, very much to Conversation. Pleasure. wonder if you had, maybe we don't realize it enough, uh, the, the uh, uh, General Eisenhower saying we ought warn against a military-industrial complex and the implications of that as we came out of the Second War. 
But the degree to which the American economy is motivated and run and is influenced by military decision making and so forth, maybe you could spell out in some general detail the degree to which military um, spending, military prerogatives and so forth do dominate or do influence the American economy. From that perspective, maybe we could talk some possibilities of conversion. Um, I think it would help to mm. uh, define something about the scale and characteristics of the military economy since uh, the, the ordinary textbooks, except for one in this country, by Professor Fussfeld oh. at Michigan, University of Michigan, characteristically omit all reference to the military economy as a differentiated entity. Oh. From the ordinary textbooks, you'd, you'd guess that the military industry firms are just like all other firms. Stocks and bonds, they buy and sell, they have offices, annual meetings, reports, and so on and so on. In fact, they're really quite different. They're different fundamentally in that the ordinary industrial firm and the classic model uh, maximizes profits by minimizing costs. Yes, of course. Among other things. Yes, uh -huh. of course. Yes, yes. Well, in the case of the military industry firm, of course refers to the maximizing of costs, not the minimizing of costs. And cost is maximized as an automatic consequence of operating according to the rules for managing that are laid down by the Pentagon. Then how in the world does such a firm maximize profit? It does it by the difference between the cost maximizing and the subsidy maximizing. We have 35,000 such industrial facilities in the country that are prime contractors to the Department of Defense and there are something more than 100,000 subcontractors mm. associated with them. That's only the beginning of the measure of the order of magnitude that of the military of, economy. That in and of itself would involve a great number of the people employed in our economy? It certainly does. Uh -huh. uh, there are about a three and a quarter million people directly engaged in those services. Uh -huh. And that, of course, is a, a modest statement as it doesn't imply the side effects, those who are secondarily or in a tertiary way uh -huh. involved. Uh, the military enterprise in an industrial capitalism is, ought to be uh, first denoted, I think, by the degree to which it uh, has preempted or controls capital. Finance capital is the term we use for the large bundles of money that can be used for industrial and other investments. And it was President Eisenhower, last day in office, who mm -hmm. told the country that... Um, the military enterprise now uses each year more money than is represented by the net profits of all U.S. corporations. And that has been true every year from 1951 to the present day. Uh -huh. So as a controller of finance capital, there's nothing in the U.S. economy that compares with this. Another way of understanding the yeah. matter is that the military economy has the largest management organization of any industrial management in the country. From a real sense, it's the government of the United States it, 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 well, at a certain level. Or at a certain level, correct. Uh -huh. And that's implied by the ability to draw on the resources of the country f via the tax process. Uh -huh. But simply in terms of organization and structure, there are now more than 120,000 men and women 120,000, yeah. who constitute the central administrative office over the 35,000 uh, contracting and subcontracting firms. Yeah. Well, central office means that the contracting firms relate to that central office the way, say, the Chevrolet division of General Motors relates to the central office of General Motors. Uh -huh. So make no mistake, what we have erected, notably since... 1961, when McNamara set up this central office apparatus, mm -hmm. is a form of state capitalism. Yeah. That is to say, a business capitalism in which a, an organization, an office, literally, situated in the government exercises final control. Mm -hmm. There's a, an associated feature of uh, this economy that's of critical importance for appreciating where we are today. The products of this economy are in all cases goods and services 
but can't be used for ordinary consumption or for further production. So a nuclear-powered submarine is a technological masterpiece. Indeed. Yeah. But you can't uh, eat it, wear it, ride in it, or live in it. That's right. And you can't make anything with it. Yeah. So it's of great importance to understand the scale of resources that we've put into the military economy. A good way of seeing this is afforded to us by the uh, controller of the Department of Defense, who reported just a year ago that from 1947 to 1987, now you have to watch carefully yeah. and get out your pencil to record the big numbers, uh. from 1947 to 1987, measured in 1982 dollars, the military received 7,620 billions dollars Holy in goodness. appropriations from the Congress. Uh -huh. Now that is, of course, an enormous sum. Staggering, yeah. But the important thing is to see what it means, and you can only gauge that in relation to another capital-type entity. And a good one is afforded by the tables of national wealth that are ordinarily published in the government statistical abstract of the United States. So we know, and again for 1982, that the money value of the industrial plant and equipment of the whole United States and the money value of the infrastructure amounted then to 7,292 billions. Now, to clinch the point, uh -huh. we put more capital-type resources, capital-type of every sort, fixed capital, working capital, into the military than would be necessary to replace the largest part of what is man-made on the surface of the United States. Good Lord. Good so, Lord. Mm -hmm. that brings us to where we are now mm -hmm. in a certain essential way. Because the country is large and rich, but it is not indefinitely large and it is not indefinitely rich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This kind of preemption of resources that has taken place goes far to account for what is otherwise a mystery to many Americans. How could you have a growing money-valued national product and have the decay and disrepair that is now visible in American industry and is visible in infrastructure. Yeah, and sociological problems of homelessness and other kinds of things, which is another dimension to that. Which is in part a reflection of the decay in industry uh -huh. and the decay in infrastructure. Uh -huh. Let's put the thing in another way. Characteristically, from the onset of industrial capitalism until the recent past, it was ordinarily appreciated that the central problem of industrial capitalism in a combined way was the problem of fluctuation of market demand. That was called the boom and bust problem of recession, depression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the U.S. now has a different kind of central economic problem. The new problem is incompetence in production. That never existed before. Look around us in the room where we're doing this very interview. Yes. Uh -huh. See the equipment that is being utilized for recording. It's not this made in the USA, is it? No. It's not made in the USA. No. Not a single piece of it. No, that's right. Yeah. And go further. The shoes on our feet are 85% of them imported. The clothes on our backs are now 50% imported. The U.S. was once the premier country in the world in making basic industrial machinery, as in machine tools. Today, 50% of the machine tools bought in the United States are imported. Mm -hmm. The major consumer electronics that we all utilize are primarily imported. Consider the matter of uh, an ordinary cassette, audio recorder, sound recorder. Well, you can't get such a recorder made in the USA at any price. simply does not exist. Now, this goes on through a great array of machinery-producing industries and a great array of consumer products. To clinch the matter, the role of the military economy in causing this 
is denoted by two considerations. One, the military economy institutionalized a pattern of cost maximizing. Yes, this I wanted to get back to that because you brought critical, that up. And critical. And how it came about that that operated differently than the cost minimizing factor that would apply in the private sector normally. You know. It but operated this way in the military economy by decision, by rule. This was made formal rule in the Department of Defense. So there was a great struggle in the early 1960s between those who favored engineering costing, that is, comparison of alternative ways of making something, and giving the contracts to the least cost producers, assuming the quality is to be the same. Yes. Opposed to that was the school of thought that held that more spending by the military is good for the economy, no matter what. Yeah, that's another thing we want to talk about. Yeah. Uh -huh. And yeah. preferred, and preferred modes of internal operation for the prime contractors that have the automatic effect of escalating cost and price. The latter was favored by Robert McNamara, and that became sacred writ Management. in the Department of Defense. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. So they installed a management system that downgrades efficiency in the ordinary understanding of that word. The result, well, you see it in the military economy. It's obviously, it's obvious, it's ordinary knowledge. The B-2 bomber proposed for production would cost more than its equivalent weight in gold. Good Lord. A heavy tank put in production runs on 3.86 gallons of fuel to the mile. Yes, right. Uh -huh. um, numerous weapon systems are put into production and finally emerge as totally unreliable as weapon systems, if not totally incompetent, that uh -huh. is to say, tending to damage the people operating them rather than damaging a purported enemy. What about the arguments that it's in the leading edge of technological exploration and development, that uh, it's trying to find new products that are going to be able to be spin-offs from the technological research that can be voted through Congress in the name of defense, that seem not to be able to be voted through in terms of the expansion of our economy without that defense, uh, what, the imperative right. sense of the needs of defense, a sort of wartime mentality, or one that issue, general agony. One issue at a time. Sorry. Now, let's go for the point about uh, the cutting edge, the Research, leading edge yeah. of technology. If it were the case that the military products entailed major new findings, especially of a basic character, and if these had impact in civilian work, in improving it, then the United States would have the premier industrial system in the world today, as we've been doing by far the most of industrial, of military industry research. Mm -hmm. But that is emphatically not the case. Would people have argued that prior to the 1962 or change? It was that? argued early on in the 1950s and 60s, but it was dismissed. And it was dismissed for a second consideration yeah. that you brought up. Mm -hmm. Namely, the judgment was that the Congress was ready to vote the military funds far more readily than civilian funds. Mm -hmm. But that, in turn, was based on the assumption that the country was indefinitely rich and could afford guns and butter. Also no indefinitely imperiled by forces that right. uh, were, at a psychological level, people are ready to vote right. for war-making defense. Right. And the assumption was mm -hmm. that uh, more weapons means more or better defense. Yes. But, in fact, where are we today? We are, in fact, in greater peril than ever before. Quite Why? So. Because we now wield 13,000 nuclear warheads that are deliverable by intercontinental delivery vehicles. So, there is the theoretical capacity, underscored theoretical, to destroy every Soviet populated place of size more than 40 times over. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a greater military threat than the ability to destroy it once or twice or three times? I don't think so. Not even the largest military budget enables you to kill a person more than once mm -hmm. or destroy a city more than once. Therefore, you have to understand the enormous escalation, buildup of overkill forces 
as a consequence not of adding to military capability, but a consequence of adding to industrial activity, mm -hmm. of adding to the decision power of the man top managers of the Pentagon and the top managers of the industrial firms involved. Mm -hmm. Mind you, the wider public has characteristically gone along with these ideas on the assumption that doing this puts money into circulation. Yes, in that's another run. thing we wanted to talk about, that it's a stimulus to the, to the economy, economy yeah. Yeah. these defense contracts, yes. and that these kind of things that would be voted through in the name of defense, utilizing Cold War mentality mm -hmm. and evil empire rhetoric and other kinds of things, will simply not be voted through the congressional right. system, backed up by the American people for things like education and right. other kinds of things. They will not have the sense of imperative needed so in order said. to do it. And, and that kind of argument's obviously part of the one you've considered. The argument has been given for a long time now, certainly more than 25 years, that if the Congress didn't vote the money for the military, it wouldn't vote it for anything else. Yeah, that kind so of thing. So you might as well vote it for the military. And get stimulate the economy. The name of the, the name, the formal name of the strategy mm. that you've just very ably outlined is military Keynesianism. All right, all right. And it means government spending, preferably through military channels, in order to get short-run improvements in money flow in given areas of industry or regions of the country, and to get increases in employment. That idea meant has meant and does mean now to its partisans that you can regulate the economy through military expenditure, judiciously placed in particular regions and industries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the assumption was that the country is rich enough to be able to do this continuously. What's wrong? There's no question that the immediate effect of spending the money is that someone receives it and passes it on in other spending. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is also true that in the course of doing that, you employ people to do various work. What is missed completely, however, in this formulation is what happens as this strategy is used over and over and over again. And the and things of creating things that aren't really, uh, really contributing to the gross domestic uh, uh, you know, goods and services that can be useful. And, and having the effect of changing the internal character of the industrial firms mm -hmm. that are involved. I want to emphasize that latter. All right. It's obvious that you produce goods that aren't useful. Mm -hmm. It's not so obvious as to what happens inside the firms. Mm -hmm. And that, in my judgment, has now become critical for understanding where the country is now. What happens inside the firms is that the firms get turned around from being efficiency oriented to being oriented to producing increasingly complicated goods, regardless of their unreliability, on the assumption that cost maximizing is what the federal government wants. Cost plus. Uh, it's yeah. cost plus, or yeah. it's called cost maximizing. Yeah. Whatever name you give to it, it's exactly the obverse of the traditional pattern of industrial efficiency that, if you please, made this country great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, from 1865 to 1975, the U.S. paid the highest wages in the world in its various industrial plants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And obviously, the industrial firms were able to produce goods and services that served the American market and got a piece of action outside the U.S. as well. But that is now in the gravest of jeopardy. Mm -hmm. What happened is that this cost-maximizing pattern spread out into the system with the result of a special effect in a part of U.S. industry that most citizens don't have a chance to know about. And that's the part of industry that produces machinery. That is where the product is a machine. Mm -hmm. Well, the special thing about the machinery-producing industry is that when they are operating with an mm -hmm. eye to efficiency mm -hmm. internally, then wages of labor and other costs can increase, but the prices of machinery will not rise to the same degree. Uh -huh. Now, when that takes place, then the purchase and the use of new machinery looks attractive to the machinery users. Uh -huh. They buy new machinery, they use it, and the automatic consequence of that is an improvement 
the productivity of labor and the productivity of capital. Mm. That, in turn, leads to all manner of allied issues, how to share in the improved productivity. But that's a splendid, that's a splendid problem to mm -hmm. have to address. Yes, right, right, right. The awkwardness arises when there is no improved productivity to share. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now, that is precisely what has taken place. From 1965 to the present day, on the average, the average growth of output per man hour per year in the manufacturing industries of the United States has been the lowest rate of any industrialized country. Mm -hmm. How did that come about and what does that reflect? It reflects the fact that prices of machinery produced in the United States have been rising more rapidly than wages to industrial workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is the key hallmark of the cost maximizing economy. And that has had consequences that have resulted in no small dismay mm -hmm. to many people, though the, the source of that dismay is not understood. Yeah, right. I tried to address mm -hmm. precisely that matter mm -hmm. in an opening essay of the book I did recently mm -hmm. called uh, The Demilitarized Society. Yeah, we have it here on the show. Yeah, go ahead. And in the opening essay, what I did was back into this matter, and I did it by defining what are the characteristics of a first-rate industrial economy. Mm -hmm. Well, the characteristics are a rapid enough rate of productivity growth so as to be able to offset wage and other cost increases, a high and rising wage level, lots of R&D, basic and applied, having the use of a currency with a predictable value, knowing how to organize work on a large scale, and the result of all that, a rising level of living. Amen. Those conditions prevail in the United States. It does not mean... Until? Until the 1970s. Mm -hmm. By the mid-1970s, it was all over. Mm -hmm. Those conditions were checkmated, all of them, with the result that the United States becomes, in that matter-of-fact manner, a second-rate industrial economy. Which we can see evidences of all around us. You and see it all around. Yeah. All uh, around. And there's another dimension to this whole question in a geostrategic level with Mr. Gorbachev now, uh, taking the lead in terms of cutting back on some of the Cold War rhetoric. Well, and the idea of whether or not the rationale for this uh, unlimited defense spending and so forth is being undercut, and if our economy and our wisdom of our leadership can move quickly enough, or in what manner or means, or how important it is that we have a means by which we can shift from defense-oriented spending to conversion or to uh, a different thing. This is something that you've led, uh, the, 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 academic, the, the, the research, and uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about that in a little bit of time we have left. Let's today. back into that in yeah. this way. Uh -huh. Our newspapers are loaded with stories about the policy conflict inside the Soviet leadership mm -hmm. and how the conservatives in that leadership hold positions against the moves proposed by Gorbachev. The only reason we don't have it is there's not a bit enough discussion within our own leadership of that uh, same we have course exactly, we should be taking. We yeah. have exactly that kind of split right. here, yeah. but it is not to the surface because the media have simply been blacking out the existence of such a split until this very moment and the media have been blacking yeah, out right. the idea that there are serious policy alternatives in place uh -huh. of both the institutions and their ways of operating for the cold war yeah so the idea of an alternative to the cold war institutions and their policies hasn't taken off yet in yeah, the United States well, that might at be, all. That might be in part because there's a lot of people whose vested interest in terms of the current power structure and so forth, their toes might be stepped on by bringing that out. And many of the people within the media might be involved in that elite group that does tend to run this large management system of uh, a military industrialized economy that the is the United States economy. The state management in the Pentagon is locked in to the present pattern. Mm -hmm. So are the chiefs of the firms that comprise the major military contractors. Mm -hmm. So too are even the universities, mm -hmm. the sure. departments of political science and others who have gained expertise in thinking about strategies for running a cold war. Yes, right, 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 right. Well, 
what this confronts us with is the question, how can we start thinking about, literally thinking about, other ways of conducting both the domestic and the international relations of the U.S.? Mm -hmm. That's why, in honor of raising that question, that a number of colleagues and I, a year ago, founded a national commission for economic conversion yes. and disarmament right. in Washington, D.C. And you've been re writing se seminally on that issue over the decades, right. if I and may say so. And that's why, at mm -hmm. the present time, mm -hmm. there is a centrality of importance for the country that attaches to a modest proposal that is now in the House of Representatives. It is a proposed law called a Defense Economic Adjustment Act. Mm -hmm. It is really a bill for preparing, planning to convert from a military to civilian economy. Oh, man, what could be more important? And it is sponsored by Congressman Ted Weiss New York. and various other colleagues. Mm -hmm. In the present Congress, it bears the interesting designation House Resolution 101. 101. Someone decided. It's like a university this, course. Yeah. Someone decided that this ought to be the designation because it's the 101st Congress. Oh, interesting. And yeah. I think that's owing to the initiative of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. It's also a term they use in universities very often for an elementary course, Economics 101. It's right. elementary stuff that ought to be understood. This is the elementary New primer, and the maybe. basic mm -hmm. move. Mm -hmm. What's in this proposed law Please. that makes it such a quality? The cornerstone of the law is the requirement, underscored requirement, that every military serving factory, base, and laboratory above a certain size mm -hmm. must set up with funds to be provided from the administrative budget of the enterprise. An alternative use committee. The alternative use committee, half managers, half working people, named by them, mm -hmm. has the responsibility for preparing, for preparing a complete technical economic plan for the use of the people, the facilities, however revised, when the Pentagon's work is over. Boy, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now that would set in motion a highly decentralized local responsibility mm -hmm. planning process for capital investments on a scale never seen before in the United States of this productive character. And it would open the way for a major turnabout you see, in the, in the economic life of the country. Consider an adjacent feature of that bill. Tucked away in part one of that law is the <coughs> recommendation that a national council that would be operated under this law would encourage federal, state, city, and county governments to prepare capital budget plans in all the areas of public works under their jurisdiction. What does that mean? To do a repair job on the public works of the United States will entail an outlay in excess of $3,000 billion. Good Lord. This <clears throat> therefore defines an enormous array of potential markets and employment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. first for the basic industries of the country, and secondly for all of the occupations that are now heavily engaged on the military side, mm -hmm. for skilled workers, for technicians, for engineers on an immense scale. This last week, I gave a talk at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and the subject uh, I was asked to speak on was, what will engineers be able to do as the Cold War is reversed? Yeah. And I addressed this issue and pointed out that there's an immense array of new work to be done mm -hmm. by needing lots of engineering talent that it's in the offing. Consider one item, the electrification of the railroad system of the United States, now falling into gross disrepair. Were that to be undertaken, we are cons considering a capital outlay of in excess of 100 billions dollars. Mm -hmm. The work mm -hmm. would surely stretch out 10 years and more. It would require expansion and the use of the facilities of the basic industries, the machinery producing industries, the construction industries, and a vast array of working people 
of all skills and talents. Yeah, absolutely. That's ter that's that's tremendously uh, exciting in a sense because it brings into focus this very question that ought to be brought into focus in terms of the national debate and understanding. And the only problem I have right now is we're running out of time for this segment. I'd like to go on at much greater length with this. Is there ways that people who might be interested in viewing could get in touch with the uh, the, uh, they could be in touch with Ted Weiss is leading that fight, or they with your, can. your they, committee. They or the can get in touch with Ted Weiss uh -huh. in the Congress, or they can write to the National Commission for Economic Conversion and Where Disarmament would they write, at Post Office Box 15025, uh -huh. Washington, D.C., 2003. You got a phone there or not, or do you happen to know? There's a phone. It's 202-544. 5059. And once again, the name of the committee? Uh, the the committee? National Commission for Economic Conversion and Disarmament. Well, I want to thank you for all the work that you've had in terms of helping to put that commission together and for your decades-long research into these questions. And, and, and to just point out one book, you mentioned it earlier, but it's called The Demilitarized Society. It's recently out just last year, 88. That's right. And uh, an extremely interesting and relevant book that we'd like to call your attention to here. And there's a long bibliography of work, research, seminal work that you've done over the years at Columbia University. And I want to just thank you all very, very much for all of that work. And particularly here for thanking you for contributing Delighted to, to join you contributing to, to conversations and remind you in the table in the television audience, it's been your pleasure then to have the perceptions. Seymour Melman, a uh, seminal writer and thinker and provider of new tactics in terms of being able to move away from some of the perils, real serious perils of an overdependence on a military industrial pattern for our economy, and pointing out at the same time, rather than just carping criticism, pointing out viable alternatives, the direction that we all might consider at responsible level for all that work. I thank you very, very much indeed. It's been your pleasure to have its perceptions. We in Conversations invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back at, uh, again next week, same time. Uh, thank you very much for viewing again. Seymour Melman, thank you very, very much indeed. Good night. We'll see you next week. Thank you.